Hello there, and welcome back to Daddy Roll the One. I'm Martin, and this is another video in my series on the history of early tabletop role-playing games, including Dungeons and & Dragons, and one of the companies that published them, Tactical Studies Rules, and one of its later descendant companies, TSR Hobbies. Today, we're going to be talking about the origins of three different classes, Assassins, Monks, and Druids. So again, this is not going to be an in-depth look about each class across all the editions, but instead we're going to be talking about when, where, why, and by whom these classes were created for the game. This is part two of a series uh, that I did last time. I covered clerics, paladins, rangers, illusionists, and bards. So uh, if you like that, if you like that video, if you enjoyed this one, if you could please like the video and then subscribe to the channel, I would very much appreciate it. If you could share it on your social media. And lastly, comment. Let me know what you think about this video, what you think about these classes. If one of these classes is your favorite, or if you don't like any of them, or, or which ones you do or don't like. And also let me know what you'd like to see me cover in future videos, such as, do you want me to cover other classes? My plan was to finish this series with this video. But uh, if there are other classes that you want me to get into, please leave a note in the comments and let me know. All right, so we're going to start off with Assassins. So where does this class come from? They still exist in the game to this very day. So uh, it, as a subclass to Thieves in 5th edition, but they go all the way back to the earliest part of the game. So uh, original D&D, this is book three of the three book series, Underbar uh, Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. And there is a section in here on hiring specialists. And in the specialist section, there is a... Uh, section where you can hire an assassin. So all it says is that the role is self-evident. The referee decides whether the assassination is successful or not, and it gives you the cost. It's 2,000 GP permission to hire an assassin. So they are listed in this book. So this is this is the original, you know, one of the three original books for D&D &D 1974. Okay, so it was there, and it is possible also that the assassin was a vocation in Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. So again, just as a reminder, if you've seen my history videos, you understand Blackmore and the game that preceded it, where Blackmore derived from Bronstein. These were war games. Okay, they weren't role playing games. They're they're kind of proto role playing, but they're not role playing the way we think of it now. And in these games, characters had objectives and goals that were different from every other character, and they were often at odds with each other. So these were not cooperative games where players were working together to achieve a specific goal. These were games where each character was kind of out for themselves. Now, sometimes they'd make alliances and stuff with other players, but for the most part, they were playing against each other. So as an example, we know that uh, there was a Bronstein game that Dave Arneson played in. I believe it was the fourth Bronstein game that Dave Weasley ran. And in this one, unlike in previous Bronstein games where he was running sort of a Napoleonic era German town of Bronstein, this was still a Bronstein game, but he was running it in a sort of banana republic in South America in uh, the 1960s. And Dave Arneson was assigned a revolutionary type character. And one of his goals was to distribute all these leaflets about his political beliefs. So Dave Arneson takes his character and he creates all these fake documents to um, portray that he is a CIA operative. And Dave Weasley just kind of goes along with it. So Dave Arneson is playing in the game and he's introducing himself to the other players and their characters as the CIA operative. And the other players have no reason to disbelieve him because he has all this documentation. And why would you create that if it wasn't real? And some of them thought that the documentation came from Dave Weasley, but it didn't. Dave Arneson just created this whole concept and he basically fools all of the other players is able to get them to tell him secrets, take their character's money. He buys a helicopter, he or you know rents one. He flies away and he distributes all his leaflets from the air and he wins that game of Bronstein, okay? So if you think about a CIA operative in that game, it's not a far stretch to get to the idea of a spy or assassin type character. So it makes sense that Dave might have thought of this and had it as a vocation in his Blackmore game. We know from my last video that the cleric was specifically created to counteract the abilities of another character in that game to counteract the abilities of Sir Fang, the vampire. So a vampire hunter type class was created, which became what we now call the cleric. So the idea of creating a class like an assassin to then counteract or counterbalance what other characters are doing in the game so that you can get kind of a leg up on them or have an ability that they don't have, it totally makes sense. Uh, however, 
we don't have documentation for who the first assassin player was. It's not listed. Unlike the cleric, we know who the first cleric was. We know who the first paladin was, things like this. We don't know who the first assassin player was. Now, it's been proposed that one of the people might have been a gentleman by the name of Alan Hammock. He is an early player of the games, and he ends up uh, being hired by TSR and working as a game designer and game editor there a few years later. Okay, so he was playing supposedly a thief character who designed some kind of death trap type things and uh, in the game and drew the attention of uh, an assassin's uh, guild who uh, he ends up kind of working with. So people have kind of said, well, Alan Hammock's character is the first assassin. So I don't have any documentation of that. So I can't prove that it's, it's coming from hearsay. Essentially, people said this is what happened, but it's not documented for real anywhere. And none of the original creators have ever said that this is true. And um, so I and I can't document it that he was a player in Arneson's Blackmore game. So there is a list of players that Dave Arneson has verified um, before he died, saying, like, this is the list of characters in the Blackmore game and what classes they played. And Alan Hammock and any type of assassin character are not listed in that list. OK, but it is kind of funny that. Um, years later, Alan Hammock ends up working at TSR. And he helps edit a game called Top Secret, along with the author Merle Rasmussen. And in Top Secret, there are three sort of, uh, they're called bureau classifications, investigation, confiscation, this is obviously like a spy game, right? And assassination. So that could just be a complete coincidence, but it is sort of funny that um, it's rumored that Alan Hammock was uh, the first assassin player, and he ends up creating a game where there are assassins in it. Okay, so there's that. Also, you have, um, uh, you know, some inspirations for this game. Or I'm sorry, for the assassin class, like where did the idea come from if it wasn't just made up whole cloth? So some people have pointed to this, a series of novels, the Gore series, which are uh, G-O-R, Sword and Planet series written by a man named John Lang, but writing under a pseudonym of John Norman. And these Sword and Planet stories were inspired by Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, who also wrote Sword and Planet stories. And Edgar Rice Burroughs is listed as one of the inspirational authors in the Appendix N for the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide. There's a link to that video up here if you want to learn more about that. So that's uh, the fifth book in that series is called Assassin of Gore. And so many, many of the early creators of D&D, the early designers, they were big fans of Sword and Planet genre of fiction. And so it's possible that book, 1975, uh, comes out the same year that the Assassin class is eventually published in the Blackmore Supplement 2. We'll get to this in a second. Okay. There's also, of course, the historical assassins from the Crusader era. So the um, Hoshishin are, um, you know, well known in history, and they are the inspirations for the word, the common term that we use now, which is the assassin. And then there's um, Guy, Guy of Gisborne, who is in the Robin, tale, uh, Robin Hood mythology and tales, um, dating back to at least uh, 1650. But some say uh, the character might go back to as far as 1475 as a creation in these tales. So you have um, those sources as a, a potential uh, inspirations for the character. There is also an assassin's skill listed in Empire of the Petal Throne, published 1975, uh, although the predecessor game was published in 1974. And the assassin spy tracker skill is listed here. So it's not a class, it's a skill, but that is has been um, bandied about as a potential inspiration for adding assassins to the game. So uh, there's a character named uh, Scandros the Strangler in Dave Arneson's 1986 module DA1 Adventures in Blackmore. So, and people will say, well, clearly Scandros the, the Strangler is the inspiration for the Assassin class. However, I can't find any documentation that that character existed prior to the publication in 1986. And, it and the class debuts in 1975 in this book here. So. I'm not really sure that that's an inspiration. I think that's a later edition. So there's just a lot of controversy about what the inspiration for the class was, as well as who created it. So the class debuts in this book, Blackmore Supplement 2, by Dave Arneson. Now, there are other people listed in here. Special thanks, okay? 
one of them being Tim Cask. Tim Cask is an early hire at TSR Inc. And he is actually hired to edit this particular book. That's not the only thing he was hired for, but that's a job he's given while he's here. So Tim Cask, uh, he uh, says that basically the assassin did come from Dave Arneson. It was in his pack of notes. So Tim's been very vocal that Dave didn't write a manuscript. He basically sent notes. And Tim says that he then wrote the class and the book based on Dave's notes. And so he had to do things like create one of the most famous parts of the class for assassins, which is the assassination table down here. So Tim Cask is credited with creating this. This was apparently not part of Dave Arneson's notes. Okay, so Tim says that the class was in Dave's um, notes. However, other people have said that no, it doesn't actually seem like it came from Dave. That's not something that he would have used. And that it seems more likely that it came from Gary Gygax's campaign, Greyhawk, specifically the Scarlet Brotherhood, because there are assassins in the Scarlet Brotherhood. So people said that was actually the inspiration. However, we know, um, I don't think Gary would have would have let it go to have a, his class published in here without getting credit for it. And also it doesn't really make sense to take something that's from the Greyhawk game and put it in the Blackmore supplement. Why wouldn't he have just put it in Greyhawk, the supplement that came out before this? So um, it, again, it's a little muddied where this class came from and who invented it. Uh, so the mechanics of the, of the assassin, it's really interesting. They are listed as a subclass of thief. And they uh, basically get all the thief abilities, but they get them uh, later on. So at third level is when the assassin actually gets the ability to um, have thief skills. And they have, of course, this assassination table. They can use any weapon, things like that. So things that are very common to the class this day, but they're they're essentially subclasses of thieves, although they're better at fighting. They can use any weapon and they have higher hit dice. They get D6 instead of D4. Gary repeats the class on the Player's Handbook, 1978. And uh, he copies a lot of stuff. You still have the minimum fees for the assassinations are in here. You have the assassination table and you have their chances of thief skills here. Uh, so they get all the same thief skills. And he uses the same uh, level titles that were in uh, pr pretty much the same ones that were in um, the Blackmore supplement. So that's the assassin class. So um, he, Gary changes the alignment to evil. And here the assassins are listed as being neutral. So they have no interest in the cosmic war between law and chaos. Gary changes them to evil in here, which is kind of interesting because Gary and many of the early creators of D&D were very vocal about players not playing evil characters, even though they themselves had evil characters. We will talk about that in a future video. Um, but uh, anyway, that's kind of the assassins. So uh, they disappear in second edition in the core book. And the reason of that really goes back to satanic panic. They were trying to make things more family friendly. They got rid of half orcs. They got rid of um, assassins. They got rid of demons and devils. But then they say in the in-game explanation for it is that any character that kills for money is an assassin. So you don't need a class for that. But they do show up as a kit. In second edition, Complete Thieves Handbook. Kits were little things that were designed for each class to kind of give them a little, it's almost like a 5e background, essentially. All right, so that's the assassin. So let's talk about the monk, the next class. So this is another class that debuts in this book. Now, unlike the assassin, we can't find any documentation that the class existed prior to publication in this book. So where does it come from? Well, um, we've got a few different sources. So Tim Cass does say again that it was in Arneson's notes that he sent to write Blackmore. But then later on, like decades later, he backtracks and says, no, a man named Brian Bloom created the class. We'll talk about that in just a second. So some potential sources for the for the character. Well, Blackmore, the Blackmore campaign, there's a player by the name of Richard Snyder playing a cleric character, but his character went by the name of the Flying Monk. OK, and it's described at a certain point he flies using a magical cloak, but they talk about him jumping from tree to tree uh, to escape some, uh, you know, just out of bow shot of some orcs that he'd encountered. So that jumping from tree to tree, it sounds very crouching tiger hidden dragon. So you can kind of see there's some potential elements there for a monk type martial artist class. OK, but um, 
that's really it. Now, Dave Arneson's daughter, Malia, is also listed in the list of Blackmore players as playing a thief slash monk multi-class character. However, based on when Malia was born, it's very likely that Dave added that later and claimed that she was one of the first players just to kind of like add her, add her in because it's his daughter. Um, but I believe she was born after the class was published in this book. So she wouldn't have been the inspiration for the class. Okay, Blackmore does have monasteries. It has monks. There are monks mentioned in the Temple of the Frog, which is the adventure that is published in this supplement. However, they're not the monks that we think of now in D&D terms. They're more like just standard clerics. Okay, so um, the flying monk is mentioned in uh, Dave Arneson's DA3 1986 adventure uh, that he wrote. However, um, again, it's, it's, it's not really, there's no details. It's not a class. It's just a character that's mentioned. All right. Now, other inspiration for the monk could be from Greyhawk. So Gary Gygax writes an article uh, in Dragon Magazine number 305 in March of 2003. And he says that when the monk character class was being developed, Terry was immediately taken by the concept. And so he became the first person to, to do that, meaning play that class. OK, and what he's referring to is Terry Koontz, who's the brother of Rob Koontz. Rob Koontz, an early game developer with Gary Gygax. You see Rob's name here on um, the Greyhawk supplement. So uh, Gary Gygax is saying that Terry played the, the first monk ever. So this would have been then in a Greyhawk type campaign. And uh, Terry's monk's name, just funnily enough, it was the monk with no name. And Gary suggests that it was inspired by the Clint Eastwood man with no name trilogy of movies. So, you know, uh, fistful of dollars, good, the bad and the ugly and all those. So that is a potential inspiration of, of it. And so a lot of people said that the class does seem like more something that Gary Gygax would have used. And so that it came out of Gary's Lake Geneva group and his great cop. Greyhawk campaign, not Dave Arneson's Twin Cities Blackmore campaign. Later on, Gary writes in the introduction to Oriental Adventures, or in the preface, I should say, that the character uh, of the monk, the class of the monk, was inspired by Brian Bloom. So we talked about that just a second ago. So Brian Bloom, one of the early founders of TSR Hobbies, along with uh, Gary Gygax and his father, Melvin Bloom. So Brian Bloom and Melvin were really the money people when TSR Inc. was incorporated after Don K. died and Tactical Studies Rules was dissolved. So uh, people say Brian uh, was a big fan of the TV show Kung Fu that had come out from 1972 to 1975, and also a series of books called The Destroyer series, featuring a character by the name of Remo Williams. You might know from the 1985 movie, uh, Remo Williams, the, the Adventure Begins. So this is a character, although the books were first published in 1971, and Remo Williams is described as being um, trained in a fictional martial art known as um, Shinanju. And that allows the practitioner to do things like hold breath for over an hour, rip steel doors from hinges, climb walls, dodge bullets, outrun cars, seem invisible, and overcome multiple opponents during combat, among many other things, right? So you're hearing that list of abilities. Those are all things that monks can do for the most part in um, original D&D when they are first described in Blackmore Supplement 2. So they are listed in this book as, oddly enough, being a subclass of clerics, which makes absolutely no sense because they share nothing in common with the cleric class except saving throws. So they don't share the same hit dice, the same attack values, weapon use, armor use. Monks can't cast spells like clerics. They don't have turn and dead abilities, but monks have all these other abilities that they get. So uh, as far as how they're surprised, opening locks like thieves, remove traps, listening, climbing, moving silently behind shadow. So they're more like thieves than they are clerics. I think the only reason they listed them as a subclass of cleric was just the semantics because monk sounds like it should be a spiritual type class. But other than that, they have nothing to do with um, clerics as a class. Most of the stuff that is in here for monks gets repeated in 1978's Player's Handbook. Uh, where Gary describes the monk. However, he lists them out of order. This is the one class, even though it's core, it's not alphabetical. And he says it's because they're so powerful, DMs might not want to allow them. So one funny little thing that's in here, well, a couple things. They have four-sided hit dice. That, however, they get two at first level. 
so that's a correction to my video last time on Rangers, where I talked about how Rangers were the only class that got two hit dice at first level. I had forgotten that monks also do in this version. In the OD&D version, they did not, but in AD&D, they do. Now, these level titles, it is suggested once you get up here to like Master of Dragons, that Gary Gygax was inspired to create these titles from the honor tiles from the game Mahjong, where you have the four wins. So these are the non-numerical titles in Mahjong, the four wins, east, west, north, and, north, and south. And you also have um, the three dragons, red, green, and white. And so Gary was inspired by that to create these titles. So um, that's kind of the bit of history on monks. Now, monks are later moved to Oriental Adventures, 1985. They're moved out of the Player's Handbook. They're the only class that makes the jump from the Player's Handbook to, um, to Oriental Adventures. This, again, this is my only book where this is happening, but this book is notorious for poor binding, and it's just falling apart. Um, the Barbarian class does appear as well, um, but it makes the jump from um, Unearthed Arcana. So the only class from... Player's Handbook that appears in here is the Monk, and it's kind of redone. It's almost exactly the same, but Gary says it's it's in the proper context once it's in this book. Okay, Monks, like Assassins, don't appear as a class in 2nd edition d and uh, They do appear as a character kit for clerics in the Complete Priest Handbook. It was called the Fighting Monk, and it's essentially a martial artist. Doesn't share many of the abilities, so kits were not super powerful. Kits were not like um, subclasses that exist in 5e. They don't give you a lot of abilities. Basically, what you got was a few tweaks, and then you had to take like a few hindrances. So um, it's inspired by the idea of the monk from from uh, here and, and from Blackmore, but it's, it's kind of just a little bit, it's very watered down. I'll just put it that way. All right, we're going to jump now to our final third class, which is the Druid. So once again, Druids, where did they come from? Well, we don't know. So uh, there are three kind of possibilities for the inspiration for why this class is in the game. So uh, what we know is that Gary Gygax was listed much later on so in, uh, in interviews, and he said that he was basically inspired by um, Julius Caesar, by the Gallic priests that Caesar mentions in his um, commentarii de Bella Gallico. And so... Uh, and that's, you know, they are mentioned in there. And Gary even says when he describes them in the player's handbook here, when he gets into the Druid, he says that they are um, visualized as medieval cousins of what the ancient Celtic sect of Druids would have become had it survived the Roman conquest. So, okay, sure. That, I guess that makes sense. I mean, Gary's a smart guy. You know, he would have known about the historical Druids. However, why take that one thing from that one specific document, one writing from Caesar and say, oh, I should make a character class for this out of all the options that he has. And it's one of the few that are really just based on like an historical idea. You know, he gets the fighter class really is coming from his ideas of Conan, the barbarian and Fawford and the gray mouser. Um, sources are coming from sword and sorcery fiction as well. And, you know, he's got clerics uh, that he's basing on, um, you know, uh, the idea of the vampire hunter from Dave Arneson and coming out of those stories. So why pick one historical type thing and say, I'm going to put that in D&D? &D? So it's possible, but there are two other options, I think, that make a lot more sense. So uh, James Malachewski in his Grognardia blog, he writes that there's an author by the name of Harry Kuttner that was writing stories that appeared in Weird Tales magazines from the mid-1930s to 19, uh, early 1940s. And uh, these are about, they, they're sword and sorcery stories. They're later collected in a collection that's published in 1985 called Elrak, Elrak of Atlantis. However, that wouldn't have been available at this time. So, um, but it's possible that Gary might have read these stories. And in it, there's a character by the name of uh, Dalin or Dalin, D A L A N. And he is described as a druid. And that he's associated with abilities, or he's given abilities in these stories that we associate with the druids that appear in D and D. So moving quickly and hiding through trees and, and not being, you know, disturbed from the undergrowth and things like that. Also belonging to like this secret order that has its own hierarchy that exists outside of regular civilization. So like a druid circle, right? Things that we think about that are associated. So we know that 
Gary Gygax was a huge reader of sword and sorcery fiction. It's the primary influence to D&D, even more so than Tolkien. It's sword and sorcery fiction because that's what Gary grew up reading when he was a kid. Um, also, um, uh, we know that he read Weird, Weird Tales magazine, okay, which is where these stories were published. Now, there's another contender that is mentioned, which is Tross of Samothrace. These are, uh, this is another collection of stories by an author named an author named Talbot Bundy. And he wrote a series of short stories and novellas in a magazine called Adventure Magazine in the uh, early, mid 1920s. And in these stories, he mentions a mystical uh, a benevolent secret society of um, secret mystics, which include the Druids from Britain. So that was also an option that either Gary or Brian Bloom, who worked with Gary on Eldritch Wizardry, might have seen. And so that, I think it's very, very possible that those stories might have what might have been what sparked the imagination. Say, I want druids in this game because they had read them in a fantasy fiction sword and sorcery context where it would have made sense to have a character like that rather than just plucking something from history and saying, oh, I'm going to make it into a fantasy version with magic and things like that, because that again, doesn't really make sense as much to me. Now, do I think Gary read Caesar's uh, commentary I de Bella Gallico to help um, ground the Druid a little bit and, and expand it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes sense. But I think he had to have been inspired by something else. So uh, given that, uh, the first appearance of the Druid is in Greyhawk, interestingly enough, Supplement 1. So they are mentioned uh, as a monster type. So uh, in here, Gary describes them as, sorry, page 34. Okay. As uh, men are priests of neutral type religion, and as such, they differ in armor, content, okay, whatever. Basically, they get powers of clerics and magic users, and they can wild shape. So those are the basics of this class, but they are a monster. Okay, later on, Gary says that he is encouraged by his friend Dennis Sesteri, or, or Sester, who uh, most people would know most famously as the designer of the Bunnies and Burrows role-playing game. And Dennis encourages Gary to change that character from a non-player character monster class into a player character class. So that's where you get Eldritch Wizardry, 1976, the third supplement for original D&D. And in here, you have the appearance of the Druid class. Okay, and so a lot of the abilities that the Druids are going to get in here are things that are uh, going to stick with the class for a very long time. Identification of pure water, of food, of animals, of plants, uh, you know, wild shaping. Again, it's kept in here. Uh, for They get their own spell list in here, so they're no longer using the Cleric and Magic user spell list. And uh, so many of the other abilities. And then Gary keeps those when he publishes the class in the Player's Handbook. So... Uh, they keep uh, pretty much keeps all those abilities, adds a few more, and he's got these fun level titles. Now, uh, one interesting thing that we see with all three of these classes, the assassin, the monk, and the druid, is the idea that at higher levels, there are fewer and fewer of these classes or of those levels available. So uh, for druids at a certain point, uh, if you want to move to the next level, there's only nine of those total in the entire world. And so if there's not an open slot, you either have to wait until one of them dies or you have to challenge one of them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you win, then you get to be that character. And the guy that loses is bumped down to the next level at the lowest number of experience points that you could needed to get to that level. So you're losing basically a whole level's worth of experience points if you lose that combat. And uh, the uh, monks do that as they uh, move up in level, as does the assassin at the very highest level. To become the guild master of assassins, you have to uh, kill the, or ch at least challenge and win over the, the, the current guild master. Otherwise, you are capped out at what your level is until, until that changes. So very odd that it's those three classes and then the three later additions to the game. So uh, we have the first appearance we talked about. Uh, how they move into uh, the player's handbook. Now, druids, unlike uh, the other two classes, they do end up look in second edition. So they're still a character class option, a subclass of cleric in second edition. And as we all know, they're still part of the, the game to this very day. Okay, so that is our look at these three core classes. Again, if you want more details on these or you want me to cover other classes, whatever, let me know in the comments below. 
So up next, uh, I'm going to be doing another video on my campaign and session prep. So I've had one of these so far, and I would please encourage you to watch it. Uh, I, I know many of you who are watching this video right now are probably thinking you're not going to going to watch that because it's not part of my history videos. I am, however, running an old school game for that campaign. It is Moldvay BX, and I do talk a lot about that game, the mechanics that we're using. Uh, I know in the thumbnail, I did consider this, but I put it was for my daughter's campaign. And I think a lot of people might think that I'm talking about a kid's game. She's a teen. I don't change the game for them. Um, so it's not about how to run a game for kids. That's not what it's about. This is just about my session prep and, and the ideas that I'm getting and how I'm inspired to put a session together and how I plan a game. So please, I would encourage you to watch that video. Um, also, I'm going to be doing a video on fire and forget magic in D&D or what we call Vancian magic. So that will be coming up soon at another point. And uh, so until then, I would like to say thanks for your support. And if you would like to support me in another way, please visit my shop where you can uh, buy shirts and hoodies and items with uh, exclusive tabletop role playing game uh, inspired designs. There's tons of links below where you can uh, see all those. And uh, so with that, uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for watching and stay safe. Happy gaming. And I will talk to you next time. And here's the bonus content for this video. Uh, what am I drinking and what was I listening to when I made my notes for this video? So the drink is this beer, a gift from a friend, also at my last D&D session. This is Blue Heaven from Topa Topa Brewing Company in Ventura. This is an India Pale Ale IPA. And Blue Heaven is what we locals refer to as Dodger Stadium. So hopefully I don't get a lot of hate from people that hate the Dodgers, but this is where I live and it's my home team. So uh, again, an IPA. And uh, I also found this one kind of refreshing. Much less bitter than a lot of IPAs, but it does have, you know, definitely does have that kind of bitter kick to it. I'm just used to that flavor profile. Musically, I was listening to Monk's Music, 1957. This is a repressing. Uh, I really love this one. This is um, the Thelonious Monk Septet. And what's cool about this is a lot of luminaries that we're used to from the jazz world appear on here with Monk. So especially, uh, particularly, you've got Art Blakey on drums. You've got John Coltrane and Coleman Hawkins on tenor saxes. So, uh, you know, along with some other guys, but those three specifically, uh, I thought was really fun. So just a fun record. Uh, again, I'm a jazz guy. So this is uh, this is right up my alley. All right. Thanks again for watching. I'll talk to you next time.